My name is Evan Dasky. I'm a data scientist and program officer at the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, so in that role, I do a little bit of data science. Um, so I work in service of our teams, our grantees, folks who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford data science services. We help them out with that. And then I also fund uh, tools, infrastructure, uh, help people start products to make sure that machine learning tools are accessible to people who are working on uh, development and humanitarian problems mostly. Um, across this work, uh, one of the biggest problems that we face is building labeled dating sets for machine learning. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we kind of took a step back and did some research this past couple months. I'm going to share that research with you. Um, just to kind of get everyone on the same level, we do a one minute introduction to supervised machine learning. Uh, for those who haven't uh, sort of encountered this field before, the basic idea is that we're going to show an algorithm or computer a set of objects, let's say they're pictures, and we're going to show that a set of labels, let's say what's in that picture. Typically maybe be a bounding box around where actually the cat is in that picture where the dog is. We show it a lot of those, so we can pick up on features, we can pick up on general patterns, and then we show it something out in the real world. It might be a slightly different cat, a winking cat, or a dog with a different collar, etc. And then the algorithm is going to make a guess and say, I actually think that that looks a lot like what I've learned to be a cat or a dog. This is only one subfield of machine learning, but it tends to be where we spend a lot of our time, right? Um, this is where, when we're saying, we want to automate diagnosis from uh, medical imagery. This is a big part of what we're doing. When, um, when I fund a team that wants to detect crop yields from space uh, in Africa across whole continents, that's what they're doing. They're doing a lot of supervised machine learning. The problem is, is that in the environments where we work, the data sets that do exist are incredibly biased. So incredibly low representation. If you take ImageNet or um, its sort of somewhat successor, Open Images, probably the two biggest um, machine learning imagery data sets, 60% of those images are coming from just six countries in North America and Northern Europe, right? So that means when you show a classifier, is this a wedding? And it's a wedding, say, from Pakistan. The classifier won't know that that's a wedding. Uh, that's sort of trivial in that case, but you can imagine that transported into the medical field, right? Identifying cancer, identifying symptoms of a uh, heart disease or heart failure, things like that, and it becomes catastrophic. It becomes tools that we can't even begin to use. Similarly, um, in many places where we're getting transactional data, say even like open data from our cities, that encodes a lot of bias, a lot of racial bias. I mean, there's a great study, uh, I'll be linked in my, uh, work here, but from Rashida Robinson, basically looking at police departments that were under consent degrees. So they were literally being investigated for racist policing and then using that data directly to build classifiers about where they should police in the future. So even if those police departments fix their policies, fix their work, they weren't fixing the algorithms that were built on those data. And these patterns repeat over and over again in the places where we work. So we said, let's take a step back. Let's talk to some of the people who are building these data sets. Let's talk to some of these people who are building them in industry. Let's talk to academic researchers. Let's talk to critical thinkers who are thinking about this. And you know, ask them a set of semi-structured questions and work through it and say, how do you build these data sets? What motivates you? What are the technical challenges you're running into? Um, what data sets have you seen that have been really effective? What data sets have disappeared quickly? About 20 folks. Um, I'm not going to attribute anything to anybody because a lot of folks actually are working on new stuff, potentially IP related stuff. Uh, and then I will also note that most of the interviewees are focused on text applications or imagery applications. Uh, so we don't have anyone in here who is, say, looking at audio or things like that. And those are unique domains, don't want to discount them. Uh, but most of these folks are working on text or images. Here's some of those lovely folks. Um, these, these people are doing really awesome stuff. So uh, for example, Desmond Patton, uh, he is building a, a classifier that looks at um, Instagram posts and tags whether there is actual uh, sort of a true threat and not for police departments, but for harm reduction folks who are working on this stuff in Chicago. This is a really, uh, the idea of you know, giving communities access to algorithmic decision making so they can help and preserve their sort of communities is an amazing thing. Um, Mutemba, or sorry, Mutembasa Daniel is working on building classifiers for um, essentially wheat rust in cassava. And that means going out, working with farmers, collecting imagery from them, building incentive structures to get them to send imagery, <laughs> making sure they aren't cheating on those imagery, et cetera. And so these are just amazing folks. Be happy to look up any of their research. It's really great stuff. Today I'm going to share essentially five lessons from this work. And these are lessons that are, are more general. So in addition to each of these overarching lessons, we have a fair amount of research that goes into like each domain. Um, they'll be more specific. But I want to take a step back and say, across all of these initiatives, what are the five things that we're kind of learning or seeing in general patterns? 
The first one is that motivation shaped data sets. More so than any other thing, when we dug into it and we we're asking people, wait, why are you doing this? People are at completely cross purposes. There's a set of um, motivations I'll describe as commercial, and those are essentially people who want to build a new product. There are people who are saying, well, I've got an idea, I probably pitched it to someone somewhere, and I need enough data to just build that minimum viable product that's going to get me the fundraising to go do the thing. That's one set of folks. Um, there's another set of folks who are saying, you know what, I need this data set as my moat. Access to these data, to these records, to these labels records is what I need to make sure that no one's ever going to be able to come from my market. And then there's a bunch of other folks who are working in commercial settings who know they have a problem with their algorithm. So these would be folks who are working on algorithms that, um, that don't work to detect hate, that don't work to detect bias in hiring. And they know they have a critical problem, and they're working commercially to try to fix it before someone calls them on it. The second set of motivations are what I'll call methodological folks. And these are folks who, uh, frankly, care less about the substance of the data. What they care about is that the data set will be a, a benchmark. The data set will allow them to sort of compete with others, to prove out a new method, to publish, um, or to simply pursue curiosity. This is where a, a lot of computer scientists find themselves. Um, of course, there are many computer scientists with many motivations. But generally, these are the folks who are, who are approaching it um, with a little abstraction. Um, and then finally, and this is the sort of place where I find myself as a data set funder, is the applied folks. And what we're thinking about is there's no one in Africa who's building a classifier that allows community health workers to determine if a certain disease exists in geography X, right? I need to solve that problem. Across these motivations, none of them are you know, distinctly bad or distinctly good, I would say. Uh, there are some that lead to bad outcomes or good outcomes. Uh, but you tend to, when you have a project, see different people across the project with different motivations. And that leads to... Um, I would say that the, the process of managing these motivations is what putting together a multi-skilled team looks like. So you will have to have some computer scientists who are interested sort of in the pure problem they're working on. Um, this is often the problem why it's hard for us to attract some computer scientists to work on some problems that for us in the applied setting are super interesting. It's because there's nothing new to be done there, right? Like it, 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 it's totally a discovered field and it's an application problem. And so for them to go through the process of working with you on specking out a data set or doing anything like that is, that's like a lost quarter for them. Um, and then similarly, the commercial folks Folks, they're happy to talk with you about building maybe this data set, but at the moment they find out that you're going to have to license this in a certain way, that say we would make them license it open, sort of like that, they're going to walk right away. And they also have a potentially a lower bar for quality. So they might be able to just get it to a certain point where they could pitch it or build it, um, but it's not going to be sufficient for either scientific or for us to kind of release it. The second area that we found a lot is transactional labels are really worse than you think. So when you're getting labels out of electronic health record system, you're getting labels out of a power billing system. These labels are bad because they were built to do one specific test that was not train a classifier to classify something down the road. Um, they were built so that a medical billing office could efficiently send out bills to people, right? They weren't built so that you could determine within 20 minutes of someone hitting an ER whether they're going to have a higher or lower risk for, for heart failure. And that is always the case with transactional labels. And transactional labels, um, well, I say more so than any other type of labeling, carries the sort of systemic biases of a system with it, and it can be harder to see and get out. And so if you're going to use these transactional labels, which of course people do, of course there's value, um, <laughs> the basic recommendation is you have to embed with that team for six months to a year, right? And you have to really understand why these decisions are being made, what different labels mean, what are the sort of embedded incentives behind them. And, and then you can you know, consider to see if it's useful. And we, we funded teams that um, in, in the power setting, actually, some, someone who worked with uh, a large power company in Africa for two years and knew exactly where all of those data sets are broken, he's able to build a reliable demand prediction algorithm, but only because he has that sort of depth of knowledge, not just because he has access to the data. Third thing is there's essentially a labeling spectrum that we see emerging, right? So on one end, it's stuff that anyone can label. That's find me a school bus in this image. Um, that's stuff like highlight all the universities in this document. Simple stuff. You can parse that out to crowd workers. The issues there are simply making sure that you're using, well, one, that you're treating people fairly, you're paying them what their time is worth, and two, that you're giving them enough guidelines, enough rules, and setting yourself sort of a gold standard data set to compare their performance against. 
that's stuff that's, that teams are getting really good at. That's, that's totally possible, but it only addresses a very small set of the problems where we want to build data sets. On the other end, we have the experts only category. This is stuff, medical imagery. Uh, this is stuff in um, a lot of like the hard sciences. So this is stuff where <laughs> to even become an annotator is at the end of a long process, potentially a PhD, potentially sort of a medical degree. There's actually less in those two, there's less interesting stuff in either of those two fields than you think. A lot of the most interesting stuff is in this sort of messy middle. So these are things where, yeah, you could probably get some undergrads to do that, right? You could probably contract with some people in mechanical engineering to do that. And there's this, there's this weird sort of messy middle. And, and here it's stuff like, um, so we use the, uh, the example of uh, imagery of plants and diseases in plants. That's stuff that farmers in Africa working in agricultural settings, but without any formal education, can be trained to tag and identify. It can also be trained to tag and identify pests. The problem is that it's in this messy middle. It's not automatic. Not everyone can do it. Uh, not everyone wants to spend the time doing it. And, and it, it's, not, a, it's a, not necessarily a good value for folks who are on that expert end. So the kind of the three rules we're thinking about there are one, uh, first incentives, and here actually monetary incentives, while sort of necessary for a lot of this work, are really not sufficient for improved performance. Um, going back to that sort of labeling uh, wheat rust example, uh, what that team found is that simply by giving immediate feedback on whether the algorithm at a basic level thought there was or wasn't the, the sort of disease present, increased farmer compliance with giving more samples, right? So if you're getting value in that moment, you're shortening that feedback loop, even if you, you caveat and you say, you know, we're not totally sure, you should also call your farm extension worker, have them come check it out, et cetera. If you can shorten that up for people, um, that's what gets people coming back, submitting more samples, submitting higher quality samples, um, coming to your meetings, coming to your trainings, getting better at tagging things. Um, the second is new tools. So this is where um, simply building tooling that makes problems easier for people, uh, creating workflows for people, uh, doing a lot of pre-processing so images actually look more distinct and it's not as hard to trace boundaries around things. That can really increase the number of problems that people can tackle with that much formal training. And the, and the final one is um, think, kind of rethink from scratch whether you can reclassify in a different way. So instead of asking doctors who may disagree about the presence of sepsis or something like that in an emergency health setting, can you actually, for this problem, use 60-day readmission? Can you use you know, within one year death? And can you train a classifier that gets you the type of answers you want in the moment, but with a totally different, much easier kind of classification problem? Fourth. Don't ignore shelf life. So, and this one was actually somewhat surprising to me when I asked people, you know, how long is your data set going to be good for? If you, if you cut off today, it's getting this the sort of F score across the board, and, you know, in five years we actually put a new, new data set to it and then score it again, you know, how long is this going to be a viable data set for classification going on? And the answer generally is a lot shorter than I initially thought. Um, so there's differences across domains. But th the two basically rules are, one is, is this data set operating in an adversarial environment? So does someone have a motivation to adjust their behavior in relation to being scored or classified in some way? If so, that's going to be like a, almost a weekly basis. You need to figure out a system or a way to get um, new labels into your system really quickly. The second is, uh, how stable are the biological social processes that go into it? So an emergency room is really unstable. Things change in an emergency room all the time. Staff come and go, people come and go, et cetera. In that setting, you're almost on that similar cycle of like, it has a very short shelf life. You need to be funding data sets every sort of year, every quarter, every time a new sort of cohort of medical practitioners comes through. And then finally, in fifth, uh, the overarching theme here, right, is we have to think about machine learning data sets as infrastructure, not as research projects. Um, and this is something that I think a lot of practitioners will tell you. And when pushed, there's still, there's some ambiguity about what they mean by infrastructure. So it was unclear, you know, <laughs> essentially what they were saying is like, we need more money for longer periods of time to do more of the same thing we're doing, which doesn't quite sort of, uh, 
you know, I, I get why they're saying that, but it, it doesn't quite give us anything new to work with. Um, and kind of pushing a little more, what we got to is sort of this definition of, of what makes a good data set as infrastructure. One, it's ubiquitous, it's not bespoke. So it's not for one sort of, uh, one sort of uh, use case or things, or one sort of geographic use case, it's across a whole bunch. It's for a community. So thinking about um, ImageNet, like ImageNet was for the computer vision community. And that's why it sort of was a lot of uptake, right? Because they, they knew their community, they spoke to it. It's not for just one team within the computer vision community. Um, and then other signs are thinking about it as a separate budget, not a budget line. Um, and so this is sort of a little bit me writing myself as a funder, right? But if I see someone with a research project come in and curation is just one budget line, unless they have a lot of prior work and that's for maintenance, that's not gonna build an effective data set, right? We need to be thinking about separating out that budget and saying, if we really care about this domain and area, let's fund the data set ahead of time and then work with a set of researchers downstream to maintain and kind of keep that going forward. And then finally, measure contributions. There's one really attractive aspect about machine learning data sets is that we can actually see how much new data improves our performance. And so creating economies around that, rewarding people, tracking usage, and making sure that people are being compensated on those basis is, um, is a huge part of what makes this infrastructure, not a research project. So with that, I'll close up. Um, I would love to talk to anyone here who is building data sets, who's thought about this, um, specifically anyone who's thought about, like, how do these data sets differ from open source software communities? How do they differ from just simply the open data community? Um, because there isn't, there's a lot of alignment, but there's little clarity about what lessons kind of cross over. So if anyone here wants to talk about that, I'd love to. Thank you.